Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, welcome. My name is Aaron Moss. I am the chair of the litigation department at Greenberg Glusker in Century City. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Tiffany Gelat and Josh Geller. We all practice entertainment litigation and intellectual property at the firm. And uh, we know that you have been inundated lately with uh, webinar invitations for really any sort of pandemic related issue legally imaginable. And uh, some of you may need a break from that sort of thing. So this is our attempt today at counter programming. We, uh, while we have all been, been researching self haircuts and catching up on Ozark, courts around the country have been deciding opinions uh, dealing with some pretty interesting issues involving copyright, trademark, and the First Amendment. So we're going to be talking about several of those decisions today and trying to offer some insights as to how they fit into the larger landscape uh, for content creators and distributors. And a um, couple uh, notes, this is eligible for MCLE. Um, and if you have any questions during the presentation, please just submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we will try to answer as many as we can at the end of the program. So um, without further ado, let's uh, dive in and uh, start talking about our first case. And this is uh, dealing with tat copyright protection in tattoos. It's Solid Oak Sketches versus 2K Games. Now, um, the issue of, of tattoos and copyrights was actually first raised in litigation brought about 10 years ago involving the hangover part two. And the tattoo artist that gave Mike Tyson the design that you see here brought uh, litigation against Warner Brothers actually sought an injunction to prevent the studio from distributing the film claiming that his copyright in the design was infringed by the Ed Helms character that wore the design in the film. And the case raised a number of interesting issues. So for example, is a person's skin a tangible medium of expression that would allow for copyright protection in the first place? And apologies to any of you that have uh, a copyright symbol tattooed on your bicep, probably uh, not the most cool tattoo in the, in the world though. Um, another question there is, is the design only protected if it is separate from the person's body? In other words, separate from the useful article as it were to which it was affixed, or is it gonna be protectable as part of uh, the affixation to the person's body? Now, unfortunately the hangover case settled before we could answer those questions. But the new case, Solid Oak Sketches, which was decided by New York Federal District Judge at the end of March, uh, provided some guidance on these issues, although it tackled the issue from a slightly different perspective. So Solid Oak claimed to own copyrights in tattoo designs featured on NBA stars, including LeBron James and Kenyon Martin. And the lawsuit claimed that Take-Two, publisher of the NBA 2K games, committed copyright infringement by reproducing those copyrighted designs on the players in the game. And there were several defenses that were offer, offered up by the, by the game uh, publisher. First was that the use of the tattoos in the game was de minimis. Basically what uh, the de minimis defense uh, does is say that copying is so trivial that it can't give rise to a claim. Now, it's not a defense that is used very often, but it's important to remember that it does exist. The argument is essentially that tattoos are not an integral part of the game as a whole. They only appear on three of the 400 players. When the players are moving, which is most of the time in a basketball game, the tattoos are small and indistinct. They're not visible for any extended period of time. And in all, the tattoos accounted for less than point zero 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 five percent of the total game data. Now the de minimis defense may be one that is more particularly suited for video games and prediction at, uh, 
particular action video games where there's a lot of movement, probably not going to work in, in cases uh, where a tattoo may be more front and center. So if we apply this uh, to uh, a film or a television show, a poster of Le Le LeBron James in the background where his tattoo is, is part of the uh, picture, barely visible, might qualify. Um, if Post Malone is the star of your new sitcom, probably not, not going to work. Uh, the second defense was implied license. Now here, the idea is that necessarily when tattoo artists uh, put tattoos on NBA stars, they are um, implicitly giving non-exclusive licenses for those athletes to license their name and likenesses featuring the tattoos. Now, I think it, it is a better practice, certainly, if you are a celebrity getting a tattoo to obtain an express license from the tattoo artist. Uh, but notwithstanding that, I think it's a, a pretty good defense, especially if uh, you are well known and do have market value at the time you get a tattoo for the tattoo artist to understand that you're not going to be prevented from licensing your name and likeness. Now the court uh, in the Southern District of New York agreed with both of these defenses, but more significantly, the court also granted summary judgment on Take-Two's counterclaim for fair use. And this is, is one that I think is gonna be a more significant um, basis for a, a broader defense in this area. So in particular, the court found that the game's use of the tattoos was transformative. So uh, while the original purpose of the tattoo was as uh, a work of artistic expression, Take-Two's purpose was really to accurately and realistically depict the players. So it was a different uh, purpose. The court really didn't put too much stock in the tattoo's level of creativity. A lot of the designs were either not particularly um, unique. Um, for example, one of the uh, LeBron tattoos was uh, a portrait of his uh, kid. And so it was based on a pre-existing work. So the court didn't put too much stock into, um, if we can just go back to the, to the previous slide, um, to the, uh, the nature of the work being, being creative, at least nominally. Um, with regard to the amount of substantiality, the amount used, the court found, was necessary to achieve the purpose of the game, which is to be realistic. And finally, the court found that there was not much of an effect on the potential licensing market. And interestingly, even if Solid Oak did have the right to license the players' likenesses, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, even if they did have the right to license the tattoos, they did not have any rights in the players' likenesses. Uh, those were continued to be owned by the players. And so there was really nothing that Solid Oak could do with them uh, as a fixed. And so there was really not uh, any licensing market that they were being deprived of. Now, interestingly, the court in Solid Oak did not decide whether tattoos are protectable in the first place. So that's still an open issue. But the main takeaway from the case is that just because you get a tattoo that may be owned by somebody else, that doesn't prevent you from exploiting your own likeness, even if it includes that tattoo. You guys have any uh, thoughts on Solid Oak? Yeah, Aaron, I'm, I think it's just such an interesting case where we have, you know, a favorable outcome for the defendant on these three different grounds. And it really makes me wonder what grounds, if any, you know, will be strongest in the long run, in particular thinking about the de minimis aspect, you know, here we have a whole bunch of basketball players and only three, you know, three players at issue with tattoos moving very quickly trying to figure out, you know, under what circumstances would maybe that argument start to fall apart. Yeah, and I think it, it's going to have to do with how front and center um, the, uh, the, the, the players are. I mean, I, I can tell you that, that just going back years and years, de minimis, the, the kind of the famous case is the mobile um, hanging uh, 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 over a, a baby crib in a, in a movie. This was a, a case from, from years ago. But the kind of thing where it's, it's really barely indistinct, nobody is, is looking at that as a substitute for 
the, um, the original and it's really just so trivial as to not even meet the, the quantitative test of, of infringement. Um, so our next case uh, deals with Instagram and uh, Tiffany, you're gonna lead us off on that one. You may be on mute. Hello? Okay, let's, um, sorry, let's try that one more time. Thanks, Aaron. I'm excited to start off by talking about a new case that fuses my professional and personal interests as an entertainment lawyer and a creative. So Sinclair v. Mashable is an interesting case out of the Southern District of New York that deals with the fascinating and ever-growing space of social media, specifically here, Instagram a popular platform for creatives to showcase their work, especially during these unprecedented times when people such as myself are accessing and using Instagram at skyrocketing rates while trapped in their houses. While most people generally assume that by using a social media platform, they may give up some rights to the content that they share, it's important to determine exactly what rights and to what extent and truthfully, whether the larger exposure is worth those risks. So the Sinclair case helps shed light on a very limited question. In particular, when someone posts something on social media, does that give someone else the right to use it in a different forum? So the plaintiff in this case is Stephanie Sinclair, a professional photographer who is known for exploring gender and human rights issues through her work. Sinclair has a public Instagram account on which she posted a copy of her photograph of a mother and child in Guatemala, which is pictured here on this slide. Shortly after Sinclair posted her photograph on her public IG account, Mashable, an online news site, contacted her requesting to reuse the image for an upcoming article that they plan to run regarding female photographers. While Mashable offered Sinclair $50 for a license to use the image, Sinclair declined. Nonetheless, Mashable still decided to include the image as shown on this slide without Sinclair's permission in its article through a process called embedding. Now, bear with me as I'm not quite tech savvy and I wanna make sure I explain this process right. So embedding allows a website coder to incorporate content such as an image on a third party server into the coder's website. When an individual visits a website that includes an embed code, the user's internet browser is directed to retrieve the embedded content from the third party server and display it on the website. So as a result of this process, the user sees the embedded content on the website, even though the content is actually posted on a third party server rather than on the server that hosts the website. So here, Mashable embedded in its article the copy of the photograph that Sinclair had previously uploaded to the in to Instagram server. And after Sinclair discovered this, demanded that Mashable take the image down and Mashable refused, Sinclair then went ahead and filed this copyright infringement action. So in her complaint, Sinclair argued that Mashable had infringed upon the copyright in her photograph since it did not have permission to use the photo. Mashable, on the other hand, argued that it had a valid sub-license from Instagram and therefore did not infringe upon Sinclair's copyright. The court here ultimately cited with Mashable because of the explicit terms and conditions of Instagram's terms of use. So as shown on this slide, the court specifically looked to three different provisions of Instagram's terms of use to reach this limited holding. So specifically, any individual that creates an Instagram account is bound to Instagram's terms of use. These terms of use provide in the first instance that by posting content onto Instagram, the user grants a non-exclusive, fully paid, royalty-free, transferable, sub-licensable, worldwide license to the content that you post on or through Instagram, which is subject to Instagram's private policy. 
privacy policy. Next, turning to the privacy policy, any content on a public profile as opposed to a private profile is considered public information, searchable by the public, and subject to use by others via Instagram's API. And lastly, the platform policy provides the ex exactly how the public license grant works. In particular, the API enables Instagram users to embed publicly posted content in their websites. Therefore, based on these interrelated clauses, Mashable and theoretically any IG user has a valid sub-license to use Sinclair's image, as long as the image remained public, meaning Sinclair kept her account public, and as long as Mashable portrayed the image in its online story solely in an embedded form, as opposed to directly copying and pasting the image on its actual server. Therefore, this case stands for the limited proposition that an individual does not need direct permission from an author to use a public Instagram post so long as the use is embedded. This case, however, does not suggest that any author who utilizes Instagram does not retain his or her rights to deny permission to utilize his work in any other fashion, whether that be a non-embedded use on the internet or any use outside of the web. So um, we can go to the next slide. So in turning to the big takeaways of this case, as this is a clear contract interpretation case, which resulted in the forfeiting of some permission rights that an author would otherwise have over their copyright works, it is extremely important to be aware of the explicit terms and conditions on any platform on which an author or company chooses to upload their work. Relatedly, it is important to consider the costs and benefits of having a private versus public Instagram account and what specific content to post there, especially if an individual or business derives a significant amount of income or revenue from monetizing grants of licenses of their copyrighted works for online use. It's also helpful to reflect on all the issues that this case does not cover. First, this ruling doesn't necessarily mean that Instagram's terms grant a blanket check regarding the use of publicly posted content. This ruling solely addresses the specific use of an embedded photo, and it does not touch on a litany of other concerns when using another's photo publicly posted on a platform, such as issues dealing with right of publicity, unfair competition, and false sponsorship. And more specifically, this ruling is silent on whether embedding constitute copyright infringement when there are not clear terms and conditions under which an author agreed to this limited type of sublicense. So for example, this case doesn't expound upon the embedding holding in the Twitter case, Goldman v. Breitbart News Network. And so this is a case that involved another Southern District of New York court that found that in the embedded use of a tweet that contained a photographer's Snapchat photo of Tom Brady walking with the Celtics general manager was infringement when it was contained in various news articles without the photographer's permission that, were, that was discussing whether or not Tom Brady was helping the GM recruit NBA player Kevin Durant. And so the court here declined to apply the Ninth Circuit server test. And the server test generally finds that the display of copyrighted content stored on someone else's server is not infringement. But in Goldman, the court found that the server test did not apply by drawing a distinction between search engines that displayed copyright images only after a user voluntarily searched and then clicked on those images, as opposed to a news site where the user takes no action whatsoever to see the image and instead the new site actively took steps to display the image. So this case is actually still ongoing with the with Sinclair having recently filed a motion for reconsideration. So it'll be interesting to see if anything changes, but happy to see what else you guys might have on, on this issue.
Yeah, I think one of the things that I found interesting in the case, because um, it, it ties into something we're going to talk about a little later as far as the, the mental state uh, kind of requirements and how that impacts things when you're dealing with an infringer, um, and, and is the fact that, you know, Mashable asked for permission originally, was denied permission, and then went ahead and embedded it, when, you know, so it used it in a different manner. Um, but it, it raises all sorts of questions for me about the implications when, you know, you have a good faith basis or a potential argument that you maybe have a sub license or have a right to use it and situations where you may be better off not asking for permission uh, when, you know, if you're denied permission, that maybe is an argument that you, you know, willfully infringed if down the line you're found to have uh, not actually had the right to use it. Yeah, although, look, I think that, that the fact that uh, they're willing to pay $50 to uh, avoid a potential lawsuit would be a, a good reason, even if they, uh, even if they didn't think that they actually needed to, to pay it. But, but yeah, certainly um, when you talk later about ROMAD, the, the issue of, of willfulness is gonna be important. Um, so Josh, uh, you're up on uh, our next case, which is uh, another video game case, and this one uh, involving Humvees. Yeah, and this one's uh, near and dear to my heart as a, a regular user of Activision Blizzard products. Uh, so this uh, was a lawsuit brought by AM General, which is the manufacturer of the Humvee vehicle uh, against Activision Blizzard in the Southern District of New York. Uh, it's a trademark suit over Activision's use of the Humvee uh, in their video game franchise, the Call of Duty series, uh, which for those of you who don't know, it's a military style video game. Uh, and as we'll see, one of the, the kind of hallmarks of the video game is its hyper-realism. Um, so it uses a lot of genuine military equipment, including the Humvee, which obviously features prominently in uh, US military uh, in, in action. So the case involves uh, the interesting interplay of First Amendment law and trademark <laughs> law. So when you have an expressive work like a video game or more you know, traditionally, historically, a, a film or, or a book or something like that um, with an allegation of trademark infringement, courts typically use what's called the Rogers v. Grimaldi test uh, developed by the Second uh, Circuit, which is intended to balance the competing interests of the content creators' right of free expression versus the trademark holders' right to protect their trademark. So the way the test works and tries to balance these competing interests is first, the, the threshold question is, do you have an expressive work at all? Which we'll, we'll get some more uh, content on that in a little bit. Um, but then the, the test itself has two prongs, where first it looks at, okay, does the use, the alleged infringing use, have any artistic relevance to the work? Um, if it has no artistic relevance, then you're done and uh, the test is over and, you know, then, you, you know, assuming it's infringing, you, you know, they, that, that's, that resolves the inquiry. But if it has some artistic relevance, then you look to the second prong of whether the use in question explicitly misleads as to the source or content of the work, um, with the idea that the more misleading it is, uh, the less leeway you get under the First Amendment uh, to use the mark. So the court in the, uh, the Humvee Activision case did a couple interesting things on, on both parts of, of these, uh, this test. So first, in the question of whether the use of the Humvee in the Call of Duty games had artistic relevance, the court focused on uh, Call of Duty as, you know, uh, uh, and, and its realism as being a kind of core part of the game. Uh, and the court harkened back to a Central District of California case also dealing with uh, the Call of Duty games uh, where they talked about the, the demand for authentic simulation in video games and the importance of creating this realism. Um, and actually I think uh, Aaron mentioned that a little bit in the NBA case where part of the fair use inquiry there specifically dealt with the fact that you know, the, the tattoos were part of creating a realistic game and depicting the players as they appear. So this is kind of a through line in a lot of uh, uh, video game cases where you're dealing with use of trademarks to promote this artistic goal of realism. Uh, one thing I find interesting in this is it's a little easier in the Call of Duty case where the games are really clearly supposed to be realistic and that's, that's such a driving force of the games where otherwise you can have games that fall somewhere else on the realism spectrum. I know a lot of people in quarantine have been playing Animal Crossing, which is a game with a bunch of talking animals in it. It's not so realistic. 
Uh, but the kind of primary plot of the game, as far as I can tell, is you're paying off your home mortgage and, and you're buying products and things that make it so you could, you could absolutely see trademarks being used in, in products within the game. Um, but that game wouldn't necessarily have the same argument for realism as its, its primary driving feature. Um, so I'd be interested to see kind of where the case law goes on that front. Um, but then the second part of the test, as far as whether the use was explicitly misleading, uh, the court did a couple of interesting things. So in the second circuit, what uh, courts do uh, to uh, determine if something's explicitly misleading, they apply what are for them the Polaroid factors. Uh, every circuit has a set of factors for us at sleep craft that look at uh, whether a use is, is likely to confuse consumers. Uh, and you look at a number of factors, the strength of the trademarks, similarities of the products, uh, ability of, you know, how, how savvy the consumers are and able to differentiate and, and a number of other factors. And what the Second Circuit does is it takes the Polaroid factors and applies them with a sort of heightened standard saying, okay, you can't just find a little bit of consumer confusion. We need to find a lot and then we'll deem that explicitly misleading. Uh, and here the court found yeah, okay, the Humvee mark is a strong mark, but Humvee isn't exactly in the business of licensing its product to video game developers. It doesn't make video games itself. Consumers of a video game aren't necessarily going to assume that every product uh, or trademark they see in the game was actually licensed to it, and, and a number of other factors that led them to conclude that, okay, there really wasn't any strong evidence of, uh, of confusion here. But the second part that the court did that I found interesting uh, was it talked about this, this persuasive explanation concept, which comes from two uh, preceding uh, Southern District of New York cases. Uh, and the basic test was, does the content creator have a persuasive explanation for why it used the mark and why the mark was an integral element of its game? And so this harkens back to two cases. So the Louis Vuitton case, uh, it's another hangover case uh, where um, the Zach Galifianakis character is carrying around a bag that he refers to as his Louis Vuitton bag. And it's, you know, it's part of the, the humor is his kind of boorishness and he's very protective of this, this bag and he doesn't even get the name right. And Louis Vuitton sued, but the, the court basically found applying the Rogers v. Grimaldi test that, no, I mean, this is, you know, they had a good reason. It was, it was, it was a joke and it was for the sake of the, the plot and the character. Um, and, and found that it was a permissible use. Versus this earlier case, the Simon & Schuster case, where essentially you had a book uh, that ripped off the title of a preceding book and they didn't have any good explanation for why they did it other than to confuse consumers. So because they didn't have a persuasive explanation, you know, it was found to be explicitly misleading. So to me, the, the big takeaways here are, are that if you are a content creator or creating some expressive work, and using some trademark, you need to have an articulable explanation for why you're doing that and why it furthers your artistic goal, um, at least to the extent that courts, you know, pick up this, this sort of approach. And this is going to vary uh, circuit to circuit. Um, but I, I think, you know, it boils down to have a good reason for why you're doing what you're doing and uh, you, you're, you're probably going to fare better. Uh, so either of you have any uh, thoughts on the, uh, the Humvee case? Yeah, it's, um, it's really interesting to try to think of maybe some other games or circumstances where the situation might not be as clear cut to really draw that, that line, you know, here saying that Humvee wouldn't necessarily be in the general business of, of licensing to, to games. Um, whereas, you know, I think we talked about before the idea of like a NASCAR type game where it, the, it would be totally opposite. And I'm just trying to think of, you know, where, what games do we think maybe might provide a little more of a dicey analysis here where it's kind of going up on the cusp of whether or not that artistic, realistic aspect will, will, will push it forward and, and, you know, infringement won't be found. Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly right, especially for courts kind of that end up applying the consumer confusion uh, factors. Because if you have a case where the product is really prominently featured and it's a product that is otherwise in the business of licensing out its mark, you know, you're going to have a lot more likelihood of confusion. And I think you're going to have a very different case than this situation where, you know, consumers probably know better than to think that Humvee is sponsoring this video game. Okay. So um, next we are turning to a case out of the Ninth Circuit. This is 
VIP products versus Jack Daniels. And this is going to be another case dealing with Rogers v. Grimaldi, although in a very different context. So it involves uh, the Bad Spaniel Silly Squeaker, which is a dog toy put out by VIP in the shape of a Jack Daniels whiskey bottle. The text has been replaced with a various, various uh, humorous saying. So for example, the old number seven brand becomes old number two on your Tennessee carpet, which is apparently why the Spaniel was bad. Um, but the advertisement uh, featured in a very small uh, uh, print, a disclaimer, um, if we go to the next slide, that uh, to the effect that the toys were not associated or affiliated with the brand owners. And you can see they have a whole line of uh, different whiskeys and, and beers in, in uh, you know, with various humorous uh, phrases. And uh, of course, this does uh, answer the question of who has been hanging out at all the bars that have been closed to humans over the past two months. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this poor guy, I think, had one too many shots of, uh, of Doggy Walker, not, not looking so good. But back to bad Spaniels, when Jack Daniels counter, uh, complained about the trademark, um, use of the trademark, VIP filed an affirmative action for a declaration of non-infringement. Jack Daniels then filed a counterclaim for trademark infringement. VIP had several arguments as to why it was not infringing. The Ninth Circuit quickly rejected uh, the first two. Uh, the first argument was that the bottle, the Jack Daniels bottle was functional and therefore did not have a protectable trade dress. Uh, and the court found that uh, there, there were enough aspects of the bottle that were not functional, that were really designed as a source identif uh, identifier, and uh, rejected that, that argument. Also rejected VIP's nominative fair use defense. Nominative fair use allows you to describe a trademark brand using its name, uh, but here VIP did not actually use Jack Daniels' exact marks. So the court found that the nominative fair use defense did not apply. The significant aspect of the rulings is with respect to VIP's First Amendment defense. And here we go back to Rogers v. Grimaldi. Um, it's the same test that Josh talked about in the Humvee case. If you have uh, an expressive work, again, a work that communicates ideas or expresses a point of view, it's given greater leeway for uh, from trademark infringement claims than traditional commercial products. And here, the big issue uh, was whether or not this product that contained these uh, humorous uh, words was enough to be an expressive work. So the Ninth Circuit has decided cases that really show the spectrum of, of uses uh, in this area. So, uh, for example, in the Empire case, the court really had no trouble finding that Fox's use of the term Empire for the name of its TV series did not infringe the plaintiff's Empire-related trademarks because the TV show was clearly an expressive work. A little further down on the spectrum, you have uh, the Honey Badger case from a couple years ago, also out of the Ninth Circuit, where the court found that this greeting card, even though it is a, a commercial product that you buy at a grocery store, uh, that there, it was an expressive work because it does um, convey and communicate ideas. Um, and so now the question is, what about a dog chew toy? And so here the court found that even though this was clearly a commercial product, it did convey a humorous message. And the court found that it was irrelevant that the expressive message was conveyed through this dog toy. It was still an expressive work. Now, it, it raises a whole number of questions about how far this might extend. And you know, interestingly, it's a dog toy. Obviously, dogs can't read. They are just using it purely for uh, the product uh, function and not for the expressive function. 
uh, but the owners who are, are buying the, the product uh, are, are presumably doing the latter. And so the court did find that the uh, Rogers v. Grimaldi test would be applicable. Now, the court did not actually decide the test. It remanded to the district court to, um, to go through the analysis. But in the Ninth Circuit, I don't think that uh, ultimately, once you determine the test applies in the first place, it's not particularly difficult to satisfy. I would uh, imagine that you know, because the, the toy is specifically meant to evoke the Jack Daniels bottle design, the use of the bottle shape and a play on words regarding its text um, would be likely artistically relevant for that purpose. And nothing about the toy really explicitly suggests an association between VIP products and Jack Daniels. And here we do see a circuit split um, in, in connection with the explicitly misleading prong of this Rogers v. Grimaldi test. As Josh talked about in the second circuit, they really just apply a heightened Polaroid or Sleecraft analysis where they still compare all of the relevant confusion factors. In the Ninth Circuit, it really needs to be uh, something affirmative that the, that the um, defendant does that suggests or um, misleads people into thinking that there is an association between the owner of the trademark and the owner of the expressive work. So uh, generally, even though Rogers v. Grimaldi originated in the Second Circuit, it's an easier test to meet when you are litigating in the Ninth Circuit. So um, takeaway here is that while dog toys and many other commercial products are not uh, usually seen to be vehicles of expression, uh, the opinion here opens the door for First Amendment defenses over a much broader range of uses than once believed. Anybody have, have uh, other thoughts on this? Yeah, I think what jumped out at me and I, I find interesting, especially just focusing in on the Rogers v. Grimaldi part is like, what, I mean, what are your thoughts of the interplay between finding that it is an expressive work in the first place and then the, the first prong of whether it has artistic relevance? Because to me, it seems like the fact of it parodying Jack Daniels is what gives it expressive weight in the first place. If it's just a dog chew toy that's a tennis ball, that's probably not expressive. So I'm just wondering, doesn't that sort of answer the first prong automatically if you're finding it's expressive? Yeah, I think like, there's definitely con some conflation there. Um, I think it, again, once you decide that the test applies, um, at least the first, first prong kind of answers itself in a lot of, in a lot of these Ninth Circuit cases. Tiffany, did you have something? Um, no, not at this moment. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So uh, next up, oh, and I should just mention that, you know, if, if you had text on that bottle that had absolutely nothing to do with um, a parody of Jack Daniels, you know, if it was, uh, you know, the, 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 the text of, uh, of a novel written in small print on the bottle, then I think that would not be relevant to the purpose and in that situation, I don't think that there would be, uh, you know, you it would apply, but um, still raises a lot of, of issues, definitely broadens the, um, the types of, uh, of works that would qualify for Rogers v. Grimaldi treatment. All right, next up, uh, we have uh, Tiffany with a copyright termination case. Thanks. So switching back to the world of copyright, I have the pleasure of speaking to you about Wait the UMGM recording. And so this is one of two recent and significant copyright infringement decisions out of the Southern District of New York that deals with recording artists' ability to regain control of their songs by terminating copyright ownership previously granted to recording companies. So in particular, this case helps shed light on three significant issues, two of which uh, I'll elaborate more on. But in the first instance, it helps uh, go into the issue of the timeliness and the proper application of the statute of limitations for copyright infringement claims arising from previous licenses or transfers that have been terminated pursuant to Section 203 of the Copyright Act. 
Second, uh, the case deals with the requirements for termination notice to be effective. And third, the case helps talk about the future implications of using a loan out company as opposed to an actual author to grant rights. So in this case, a class of recording artists that had previously granted ownership of their songs in the late 70s and early 80s to UMGM Recordings predecessors attempted to exercise their termination rights under Section 203 of the Copyright Act of 1976 by providing notices of termination upon UMG. And so just going back to you know, the actual language of the Copyright Act, Section 203 basically provides a second chance for authors to regain control of their works. It generally allows authors of works created on or after January 1st, 1978 to terminate the grant of a transfer or of a license of a copyright 35 years after the date of the grant's execution. Termination is generally effectuated upon serving the grantee, so here, UMGM, with written notice. And once the effective date of termination has passed, the grantor, so here the musical artist, become the owner of the copyright and therefore hold the exclusive right to reproduce and distribute the sound recordings. But one huge carve out though, is that the termination right is not available for works made for hire. So in turning back to the specific facts of the weight case, the artists there brought this class action after they attempted to avail themselves of the termination right that they claimed UMGM wrongfully refused to honor by continuing to exploit their songs after the affected dates of termination. In its defense, UMGM disputed the validity of those terminations. In the first instance, UMGM argued that the infringement claims were untimely because the works were works for hire. And therefore, the three-year statute of limitations had begun to run on the artist's claims when the grants were executed decades ago in the late 70s, early 80s. The court, however, disagreed. It found that the statute of limitations had not run because the claims began to accrue upon UMGM's alleged failure to comply with the artist's termination notices. So in reaching this holding, the court focused on the explicit rationale of Section 203 of the Copyright Act. Namely, the court stated, finding that a statute of limitations began to run against an artist the day that the contract is signed would be incongruent with a termination right that does not vest for at least 35 years from that date. In particular, the, the court also found that the statute of limitations in this specific case had not run yet by focusing on the heart of the artist's claim here, which is the use of the copyrighted work and not the ownership of such work. So here the artist brought their claims based on UMGM's use of their works after the effective date of termination. The artists here were not contesting ownership at this stage in the proceedings. And while the issue of ownership, specifically whether the works were works made for hire, is clearly relevant to the merits of this case, the court found that this issue had no bearing on this procedural consideration. So in reaching this decision, the court also explained how UMGM's reliance on the Meat Love case, a day v. Sony Music Entertainment, was misplaced. Namely there, the court found that the statute of limitations had begun to run at the time the grant was executed because Meatloaf's claim in that case was based on ownership. Specifically, over 30 years after entering into an agreement with Sony, Meatloaf sought a declaration stating that he was not and never was an employee for hire for the various works that issue in this Sony agreement. Therefore, Meatloaf in essence argued that he had always been the owner of these works. So unlike the Aday case, the crux of the artist's claim here is not ownership. Furthermore, the artists here are not arguing that UMGM never had a valid or enforceable transfer or license of a copyright to enter their songs at issue. So for those reasons, the court found that the Aday reasoning did not apply and that the statute of limitations could only begin to run after the termination right vested. Another interesting holding from this case involves the impact of the use of loan out companies. So here the court held 
that the grants of certain songs that were made by loan out companies could not be the subject of termination. And the court reached this holding because the copyright because of the Copyright Act's explicit language, which states that a grant executed by the author on or after January 1st, 1978 may be terminated. The court here rejected any arguments by the artist that the use of a loan out company was merely for tax planning, was merely a tax planning device and should not serve to preclude the termination provisions. The court stated that to permit such grants to be subject of termination would run counter the plain language of the Copyright Act. And the Supreme Court has made it clear that we need to stay to what the legislature originally put in the Copyright Act. And so based on, you know, everything that's going on in this case, it's truly far from over. You know, we really are just dealing with this procedural win, if you will, for artists that is allowing their case to move on. But it'll be really interesting to see what happens as the court delves into the merits of this case, namely whether the songs at issue are truly works made for hire, whose grants therefore can never be terminated. Does anyone have any further thoughts on this? Yeah, so look, I, I think that even though the court really only addressed it in about a paragraph, the loan out issue is, is clearly the, the most important one here, given um, the potential applicability for any number of works uh, beyond just sound recordings. So most, uh, at, at least in the last 30 years, most writers, uh, other creatives, because of these beneficial uh, tax reasons, will create through loan out companies. And if those are deemed to be works uh, made for hire, then even if there is an assignment uh, subsequently to uh, a studio, those works can never be the subject of a termination notice because they were created in the first instance as works for hire. And um, again, just starting to dive into this uh, uh, issue, the court really didn't address it in, in much detail. Most courts uh, have not. Uh, if you're interested in this issue, I actually co-authored an article, um, a law review article back in, in 2012 that dealt with the implication of uh, loan out companies uh, and whether or not that is going to prevent the termination of, of these works. But it's a really uh, interesting issue and I think we're going to see it in a lot of decisions in the future. Uh, okay, our last case, uh, Josh, is uh, out of the Supreme Court. All right, so uh, yes, our last case, Romag v. Fossil. Uh, the facts of the case, I will say, are probably the driest of the bunch, but this is also, I think, my favorite case, just because the legal issue is so important and the resolution of the circuit split here is something uh, we trademark litigators have been looking out for for a while. Um, so this, this one is a, a big one. So the case involves the question of whether a prevailing plaintiff in a trademark infringement action, um, what are the circumstances in which they're entitled to the defendant's profits as their damages? So disgorgement uh, of, of the defendant's profits, which in a lot of cases is going to be a lot more substantial uh, than what the plaintiff maybe could prove up as far as their own losses. Um, so this can have very, very significant uh, impacts on, on total dollar recoveries. So the, the facts of the case uh, are, are not tremendously significant. Uh, Romag makes fasteners, Fossil makes bags. They had a license, that license went away. They have a trademark dispute over Fossil's alleged continued use of the uh, Romag fasteners. So the relevant uh, provision in the Lanham Act that this case deals with uh, is, is section 1117, which basically says that the prevailing plaintiff uh, in, in a trademark infringement action with, with some nuance um, that's not relevant here, can recover infringer profits, quote, subject to the principles of equity. Uh, and there had been a circuit split as to what that means. What are the principles of equity here? And the big question was, does the plaintiff have to prove that the infringer acted willfully as an absolute requirement for obtaining profits? Several circuits had said, yes, that's an absolute requirement. Uh, the Ninth Circuit very recently, which I'll talk about in a minute, had said that it was an absolute requirement. In the Romag case, the jury found 
that Fossil did infringe, but they found that Fossil's infringement was done with callous disregard, and they explici explicitly found that it was not willful. So it was just, you know, that hair short of willful where, where callous disregard lies. And so uh, Romag did not get Fossil's profits. Romag appeals saying, hey, you know, we're entitled to their profits. They acted terribly. They were callous, you know, with, with callous disregard. We want their profits. So the Supreme Court resolved the circuit split uh, and in a majority of, and, and all the justices agreed on the, the outcome. Um, and essentially they all agreed on the reasoning. Uh, the majority opinion authored by Justice Gorsuch acknowledges that historically and, and you know, in, in the common law and in the, the case law that had been picked up by uh, you know, Congress when it, when it wrote this statute, um, the infringer's mental state has always been very important. It's a highly important consideration. Uh, but what Justice Gorsuch and the others uh, who joined him said is that willfulness is not an absolute prerequisite to obtaining an infringer's profits. So you're going to want to, if you can prove willfulness, that is better as a plaintiff because uh, the mental state of the infringer is still uh, the most important consideration. But there may be other circumstances where a plaintiff can obtain profits um, absent a finding of willfulness. And this is elaborated on a little bit in Justice Sotomayor's concurring opinion, uh, which I think is, is helpful to look at, because uh, she talks a little bit about this sort of spectrum of mental states, that you could have innocent infringement, you could have reckless and, or willful or fraudulent infringement, you could have all sorts of different mental states. And her view, and one that I suspect many judges will share, is that you're never, or, or at least essentially never, going to get profits for truly innocent infringement. Now, there may be exceptions to that. That's not the law of the land. But that's, you know, very likely to be something that judges pick up. But when you have someone who's falling somewhere else, maybe it's just, you know, it's, it's negligent infringement. Maybe it's reckless. Then you're going to start getting into the, the camp where you may be able to obtain profits even without the willfulness finding. Um, so that leaves open the question of, okay, so what other factors are going to come into play if you have this lesser culpability standard allowing you to obtain profits? Um, and I think it's instructive to look at how this changes law, especially in the Ninth Circuit. So recently, back in, in 2017, a case came down Stone Creek, which said at the time, you have to prove profits uh, to get, or you have to prove willfulness to get disgorgement of profits. That is now no longer good law. But there's a pre-existing case that hadn't been overturned by Stone Creek that I, I find very relevant in light of the new you know, world we're living in, uh, which is the Adre case where uh, it, it, it basically said that, yeah, the norm is you need willfulness in order to get profits, but there may be cases where you don't, as in situations where the plaintiff's uh, damages are very difficult to prove, and for some reason the defendant's profits are the best measure of damages. Um, so actually, I litig litigated a case that went up to the Ninth Circuit that dealt with a situation like that, where the argument was essentially, all of the defendant's sales were sales that the plaintiff would have made. So irrespective of any finding of willfulness, the defendant's profits are going to be the best measure. Um, and, and we prevailed in that case. And I think now under the new law or the new, the new Supreme Court ruling, that's going to be more of an argument that litigators should focus on is this argument that the defendant's profits are the best measure of damages, even without willfulness. Now that said, you know, you always want to paint the, the other side to be the bad guy as much as you can. So I think the more you can show as a plaintiff that the defendant uh, was, was acting with bad intent, the better. And if you're the defendant, the more you can show that you had the best intentions, the better. So it, it, there's going to be a lot of room for lawyers to argue on both sides of the issue uh, going forward. So I don't know if either of you have any thoughts on the case. No, I mean, look, I, I think that, that as a practical matter, uh, the courts are still going to look to evidence of willfulness. Uh, it's not going to be a, a, a bright line, but uh, I, I would hope that if you have a defendant that was, for example, um, you know, let's say it was a, a, a vendor or a, a retailer of a t-shirt that happened to be infringing and the retailer obtained representations and warranties and really had no reason to think that there was a, a violation uh, that there would not be a disgorgement of that retailer's profits um, because the court would still take into account uh, that degree of willfulness. 
even though there's not a bright line, but we'll see how that plays out. So um, we have just a, a few minutes for some questions. We've, we've already received a number of them. If you've left your name and we can't answer it uh, live here, we will follow up uh, with uh, an email answering your question. But the first one uh, deals with the tattoo case. Why isn't uh, a tattoo a work for hire? Uh, and doesn't that solve the, the issue? Well, um, so the tattoo is not going to be a work for hire unless the tattoo artist is an employee of um, the, the person who he's giving the tattoo to. And if that is really the scope of, of that person's employment, probably not likely. So the other, there's two ways to, to have a work for hire. You got to be an employee or it needs to be a specially commissioned work or, where there's a signed writing. It's only though if it falls within certain enumerated categories and um, that type of a, of a work, even if we could just consider that a graphical work, number one probably would not fall within one of the enumerated categories. And number two, here there was no signed writing. So uh, we can't rely on this being uh, a work for hire. As I said, much better if you are a celebrity getting a tattoo to get something in writing, either a copyright assignment or uh, a license, non-exclusive license in writing. Um, the next uh, question is dealing with uh, Josh, the Humvee case. What was the actual trademark that was claimed to be infringed? Was it the Humvee itself or was it a logo that was used on the vehicle? Yes, yeah, so there was both a claim for trademark infringement and also trade dress. So I know the trade dress is certainly the design of the Humvee. Um, I think there was, a, you know, it was the Humvee itself and possibly a logo on it, but because of the trade dress aspect of it, it's, you know, it's for the whole vehicle. Because um, otherwise I think you could get into some questions as far as, okay, is, is, is there a logo on it that's really visible in every shot? Um, but because you had the trade dress overlay, I think whenever there's a Humvee on screen, arguably that's that's infringing the trade dress. Okay, and um, Tiffany, a question on Instagram. What about reposting on another Instagram account? Is that covered uh, either under the law or under the terms and conditions? So I think from my understanding of how uh, the terms and conditions are working, for anyone who has a public account, another individual can go ahead and repost um, a post or a story that that individual had on their story, but not necessarily on their feed. And I think that's just due to the setup that Instagram has, I think, to try to make it very clear that, it, that when you post something on your story, it may not... Let me rewind. When you post something on your feed, it might give the wrong impression that that is your own content, as opposed to when you post something on your story. A lot of people are, are used to the idea that you are, you know, basically like retweeting and resharing what other people have done. So it really depends on whether or not the, the post itself is public and your ability to share it in general is normally limited to you using it on your story as opposed to on your feed, which people tend to see as content that you've created. Got it. Okay, so we um, we got a number of questions on the uh, Jack Daniels case. Uh, two related questions. First, did the court explicitly address the issue of parity? And second, after the Jack Daniels holding, do you think courts in the Ninth Circuit might apply the Rogers test to trademark disputes involving uh, the use of another person's mark as a parody on a T-shirt or a hat? So those are really good, interesting questions. Interestingly, the court never used the word parody in the Jack Daniels case. And you know, query whether it is or is not a parody, I think it is at the very least an homage. Um, but remember, if you have a, a parody, that does not necessarily absolve you if you're applying the traditional sleek craft factors uh, from a finding of infringement. However, if it is an expressive work, then you're going to be in the Rogers v. Grimaldi universe and you're going to get much um, wider protection. So in, in answer to the question about a t-shirt or a hat, 
Um, that is a, a great question. Clearly, that would then be uh, expressive, especially if the parity were, were um, really designed to communicate a message either about the original trademark owner or about society at large. And I do think that uh, following Jack Daniels to the letter would allow for greater leeway when putting out these kind of, uh, of t-shirts, hats, other expressive works that might not qualify under the sleek craft test uh, to qualify under Rogers v. Grimaldi. And, um, and it's just another of the, the interesting issues that this raises as we move from the TV movie realm of expressive works into commercial products. So unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, we will answer questions uh, via email if you've left your name. You can also email us. We'll send you some information on how to get a hold of us. I think that there's another slide with our direct email addresses and we'll be sending out MCLE information. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. We know you have a lot of choices in, in webinars and we are uh, really glad that you chose to spend an hour with us. Thanks. Thanks everyone.